Brilliant. Well, good afternoon and good evening, everybody. Um, I know we've got people joining from many different time zones. <laughs> um, my name is Camilla Sutherland, and I'm an assistant professor in the Department of European Languages and Cultures and co-director of the Center of Mexican and Latin American Studies here at the University of Groningen in the Netherlands. Um, it's my real pleasure to welcome you to this, which is our fourth session of a series of talks on contemporary issues in Latin American studies. And today we'll be focusing on the widespread impact that the Black Lives Matter movement has had within the region of Latin America. And it's a real honor to introduce you to our first speaker, Danilo Antonio Contreras. Um, Danilo is an assistant professor in the Department of Political Science at Wellesley College in Massachusetts where he teaches courses on comparative politics with a regional focus on Latin America. His research examines how national, racial, and ethnic identities affect questions of political behavior, representation, and mobilization in Latin America. He's currently completing a book manuscript on ethno-racial politics in the Dominican Republic based on a field experiment and qualitative and survey research. He received a BA in government and Spanish from Georgetown University in Washington, DC, and his PhD in government from the University of Texas at Austin. Danilo, the floor is yours. Thank you all uh, very much. Uh, thank you, Camila, Bob, and to the Center for the Study of Mexico and Latin America for inviting me to participate in this uh, lecture series. Uh, I'm excited to engage with Marcel um, uh, today, and I look forward to answering your questions as we move forward. I'm going to uh, share my presentation now. Brilliant. So today I will talk about the promises um, uh, of and peril to Black Lives Matter uh, in Latin America. I'll discuss um, uh, what has allowed Black Lives Matter, um, which forms part of a long Black struggle in the region, to emerge in some countries in the region and mobilize effectively against the disproportionate use of state violence against Afro-descendants by state and non-state actors. Um, Black Lives Matter has been especially visible in countries like Brazil uh, with the Mothers of May and React or Die campaigns against uh, Black urban genocide and the murder, of course, of Marielle Franco in 2018 fueled these protests. Um, it has also been quite active in places like Colombia um, in September of last year. Uh, black manifestations reached re uh, really a fever pitch in the port city of, of Buenaventura against the disproportionate number of Afro descendants die as a result of police brutality, military forces, and turf wars among uh, organized criminal groups. Activists have also uh, protested against structural inequalities in which Afro descendants tend to be disproportionately unemployed and have little access to social mobility. Despite these uh, and other successes in mobilizing, however, I'll also suggest that Black Lives Matter faces important challenges, um, exacerbated inequality brought on by the pandemic and a rightward turn in electoral politics in Latin America uh, will be especially hostile for Black Lives Matter mobilization. Finally, I'll advance uh, three takeaway points. First, I'll make the case that Black Lives Matter um, is neither guaranteed nor is its emergence a matter of time in Latin America. Second, I'll suggest that where Black Lives Matter existed before the pandemic, it will need to adapt uh, to a post-COVID world. Um, and the extent to which Black Lives Matter is supported in the region will depend on the degree to which these movements are able to uh, conceptualize Blackness in local terms and in ways compatible with multiple and non-racial and non-ethnic identities. Finally, I'll argue that we should expect the Black Lives Matter movement to look different across the region and respond to local opportunity structures and constraints. Uh, black political activism in Latin America may not converge even if activists across the region are responding to similar anti-blackness and race inequality. Um, let me go ahead. Next slide. Um, so it's worth prefacing any discussion about Black Lives Matter in Latin America by stating that Black struggle and mobilization in Latin America did not begin with Black Lives Matter. This is a point that critics of Black Lives Matter in Latin America often overlook when they charge that Black mobilization in the region is simply a U.S. import. It's also worth pointing out um, 
or rather, it, uh, this is also a point that many in the global north miss. They assume that knowledge typically flows in one direction, down to the global south, rather than bi-directionally. Uh, but in fact, we can date uh, black struggle for liberation in the region to slave revolts and, and marinage, as well as to participation movements such as uh, the labor and student movements that did not necessarily advance an anti-racist agenda. More recently, black liberation movements emerged in places like Brazil beginning in the 1970s and 1980s, um, that is far predating uh, Black Lives Matter. One reason for the oversight of black movements before Black, Life, black Lives Matter might be that Black Lives Matter has been very influential in parts of the region and has overshadowed previous black mobilization efforts. Another reason might be that the emergence of Black Lives Matter in the region was simply unthinkable just a couple of decades ago. Even then, discussions about race and racism in Latin America were widely cast to the margins, and official state narratives described Latin American societies as colorblind racial democracies. These were narratives that were based on intensive patterns of historical racial mixing, the absence of institutional segregation in the region, and nation building processes that were, at least in rhetoric, inclusive, though in practice aimed to erase Afro descendants and their historical contributions. So what conditions and opportunity structures allowed for the emergence of Black Lives Matter in Latin America? One important change beginning in the early 2000s that allowed for the emergence of Black Lives Matter was that Afro-descendants demanded um, and states created official racial um, and ethnic uh, questions on censuses to produce more accurate counts of the Afro-descendant population. Um, so you can see from the figure here uh, that by uh, 2010, nearly all countries in the region had created racial and ethnic categories on the censuses from just two countries in the 1980s and 1990s. Um, official census statistics um, lend a great deal of visibility to Afro-descendants across nearly all countries in the region. Um, and it also legitimized Afro-descendants as numerically important components of, of the nation. Black Lives Matter also benefited from improved um, data collection on the magnitude of social and economic inequalities. Um, data collection helped researchers conclude that Latin American societies uh, were indisputably stratified by race, um, ethnicity, and importantly, by skin color. Uh, skin color, uh, as it turns out, uh, was highly predictive of social outcomes in the region, with dark-skinned Latin Americans more likely to lag behind levels of education and wealth relative to lighter-skinned Latin Americans, even if the relations between ethno-racial identity, color, and class inequality might vary across countries. Um, as such, uh, colorblind proponents could no longer credibly defend that the effects of institutionalized racism and prejudice um, on social conditions were simply a carryover effect from previous marginalization or simply a function of social class. Mm -hmm. right? In effect, Latin American societies resemble a so-called pragmatocracy rather than uh, a racial democracy. And as you can see here uh, from the um, uh, from the chart, right overall, there tends to be a tendency where lighter-skinned individuals in Latin America uh, tend to have higher uh, income per capita than those that are that are darker skinned. Take a, a much more sort of macro approach. Um, in looking at, at the case of Mexico, uh, for example, uh, we can see uh, that the figure on the left suggests that um, that those who are dark brown skin in Mexico tend to have higher perce perceptions of discrimination than um, uh, at all levels of wealth relative to uh, white, uh, self-identifying whites in Mexico, right? Um, that is right that indigenous and, and dark brown looking Mexicans tend to always perceive greater levels of discrimination than poor and wealthy white uh, people. And on the right, um, we see that, um, in fact, um, that a white person will be between 10% and 25% more likely uh, to, to be in the top uh, wealth distribution than a dark brown person, right? So, uh, so this suggests that uh, 
everything else being equal, lighter skin tone, um, right, is an asset um, in, in, in Latin America, whereas um, having darker skin tends to be um, a tax of, of, of sort. Um, another important um, uh, factor um, that um, really contributed to the rise or the emergence um, of um, Black Lives Matter in the region um, was um, uh, the, the extent to which Black movements were able to align with transnational Black strategies and networks of solidarities and, and discourse. Uh, scholars like Tiana Pichel have argued that Black movements were able to position their campaigns transnationally and found support and learn from networks of solidarities. Uh, similarly, scholars like uh, Geza Matos suggest that Black movements in Latin America embrace a shared transnational language of racial violence. Um, moreover, um, Afro-descendants and mixed-race populations in countries like Brazil embraced self-identification as Negro and move away from identifying with mixed categories. And so this too increased the supply of Black activists and the demand for, for greater action. Finally, Black Lives Matter benefited from the passage of um, ethno-racial legislation by leftist governments. Um, we see in the figure that beginning in the 1980s, late 1980s, um, several countries engaged in an initial round of multicultural reforms in which states um, uh, in which states recognized the multicultural and, and, and pluri-ethnic character of their societies and their constitutions. And these initial reforms uh, rewarded mostly Afro-descendant rural communities that were seen by states as autonomous um, and as autochthonous. But um, by the early 2000s, um, we see that countries like Colombia and Brazil began to pass uh, policies that benefited um, all um, all uh, Afro descendants. Um, in, in Brazil, we saw affirmative action policies meant to address racial inequality along socioeconomic lines. While in Colombia, we saw that the state reserved uh, special legislative seats for Afro Colombians in the Pacific to help institutionalize Black participation. Despite its emergence in countries like Brazil and Colombia, as well as others, however, Black Lives Matter faces um, important perils, some of which have been exacerbated by uh, the pandemic. Um, one important peril or one important challenge to Black Lives Matter in Latin America is that the pandemic has further racialized inequality in Latin America by further exacerbating existing inequalities. Um, so COVID, for example, has decimated uh, uh, sectors in which Afro-descendants traditionally worked, such as service occupations, and thus have eliminated important sources of mobilization. In addition, COVID has especially devastated populations that are house insecure, that uh, are in overcrowded prisons, that have low access to health care. And as you can imagine, these populations tend to be disproportionately Afro-descendant. So this has worsened uh, health outcomes and human, develop human development for, for descendants. Um, um, as such, it is unclear whether um, COVID has robbed these communities of important material and organizational resources for mobilization. A second challenge that Black Lives Matter in Latin America faces is that um, ethno-racial identity and ethno-racial base exclusion do not necessarily drive Afro-descendant mobilization in Latin America, right? They're not necessarily at the center of Afro-descendant mobilization. And this is true even as race continues to shape social outcomes for Afro-descendants and structure societies, right? So, for example, in countries like the Dominican Republic, which I study, uh, racial inequality and racial identity have not been at the center of racial movements. Um, and individuals uh, may not even necessarily perceive that their inequality is based primarily on race. So this limits the supply of racial entrepreneurs, right, that might mobilize um, racial grievances, um, and it also limits the demand of action against race-based inequality. An additional challenge that Black Lives Matter faces is the prevalence of the social class fallacy in Latin America. That is, that inequalities are structured by class, not by race. Um, and so states that engage in this fallacy are more likely to support universalist policies rather than race-specific 
policies. Finally, the region's recent turn to right-wing uh, populist and institutionalist um, might slow some of the progress that leftist governments made to pass race-based race legislation. Um, and in fact, some scholars have suggested that a white lash or backlash by whites in Latin America to the politics of racial equality um, has at least contributed to, in, in some way, to the turn to right. Um, Nevertheless, uh, there is reason to expect that Black Lives Matter will remain consequential in specific countries in Latin America, even emerge in unexpected sites. Uh, first, over the past three or four years, uh, some researchers have found evidence that Afro-descendants exhibit high levels of Black consciousness in countries like Puerto Rico, Cuba, and Brazil, um, and that Black consciousness can encourage forms of political engagement that could potentially help support Black Lives Matter movements. Secondly, countries have passed important legislation over the past decade or so to institutionalize Afro-descendants in politics. And so it's possible that the political institutionalization of Afro-descendants through um, mechanisms such as reserve seats, as well as legislative and party quotas might provide a pathway for uh, the leadership of Black Lives Matter in Latin America to enter electoral politics. Um, and, and this matters because some believe that increasing the participation, the descriptive participation of Afro-descendant candidates and legislators will in turn lead to greater sponsorship of, um, of race-based legislation that address uh, inequalities. Finally, um, there's increasing evidence of what um, Mala Thun calls organized politics of race coming out of places like Brazil. And so, for example, in the most recent municipal elections, more than a thousand black women ran for office, which represented an increase of 60% from the previous election. And many of these women ran under the banner of anti-racism, right? So there seems to be some evidence, uh, at the very least, that um, uh, Afro-descendants are, are participating in greater numbers um, in electoral politics. So given these perils and promises, then, what might we expect of Black Lives Matter in the post-COVID world? Now, this is, of course, a difficult question to answer, but I think we would do well to, at the very least, check some assumptions about Black movements in Latin America. So first, or the first assumption that I think um, is worth checking is that um, movements with racial identity and demands for racial equality at their core are not widespread in the region, and thus their appearance is neither automatic um, nor a matter of time in Latin America. There's the sense that with time or as um, group consciousness uh, increases in, in uh, Latin America, that somehow this will lead to uh, black movements or, or movements that um, place racial equality and racial identity at their center. And again, this is sort of an assumption that, that doesn't necessarily pan out in the region. Secondly, um, where Black Lives Matter existed pre-pandemic, um, I believe it will need to adapt to a post-COVID world to survive by creating um, capacious and local understandings of Blackness. Um, so the more Black movements conceive Blackness in ways that allow for national, um, subnational, um, or even local identities to be coterminous with racial and ethnic ones, the more likely Afro-descendants in Latin America uh, will be to support them. Um, and then finally, um, that we should expect the exp that the expression of Black activism will vary across Latin America, right? That not all Black movements or even Black Lives Matter movements in the region will look the same. Um, what Black Lives Matter movements will look like in the post-COVID world will dramatically differ across the region, just as they did before the pandemic. Um, so although Afro-descendant activists across the region face similar grievances and exist within a broader transnational, anti-Black, and anti-colonial framework, they will have to navigate with very different understandings of Blackness and mestizaje, or racial mixing, um, and distinct opportunity structures. So we should not expect for um, Afro-Cubans or Afro-Dominicans, for example, to engage in Black activism in the same way that we've seen Afro-Brazilians um, or Afro-Colombians. Um, thank you very, very much for your time, um, and I look forward to, to your questions.